this discussion, this interview, or this talk. So Hannah, of course, uh, we appreciate your time and thank you for um, sharing your story, which I know will be certainly interesting and one which I'm sure we'll learn from. You've got a lot of experience. Hannah runs a number of different things. She's very much a community oriented person. She's got a radio show, but I'm sure she'll tell you all about herself. In <laughs> um, she will also welcome, I will facilitate any questions that get posted on the chat but we will address them afterwards. So we're not going to address questions as we go along because it gets very um, disruptive. So Hannah, you do your talk. And once you're finished, we will then um, address questions, okay? Okay, thanks very much. Wonderful. Rabbi Rabin, I just want to say that um, South Caulfield Hebrew Congregation has a very big uh, part to play in our, in our um, family because um, my dear father-in-law, Tishran Racha, uh, David Baum, he was a president of South Caulfield um, in the 70s, and Jeffrey, my dear husband, who was here a second ago, has just gone inside, um, was a member of that shul, his sister Rachel, who still lives here, and Reuven, who is in Yerushalayim, they were all at South Caulfield. So it's a very dear shul to, uh, to our family. And also, I must say, I was very proud to interview you and your wife, Sarah, in the shul, not long ago for our J Air Radio. Yes. This is going to go out on J Air Radio, Rabbi Rabin, on Thursday, some of it, because it's also on, uh, on Facebook, which is fantastic. J Air Radio, Thursday morning, the Baum interviews, 87.8 FM, J dot air, no, J dash air, sorry, dot com dot au. So I want to tell you, first of all, before I launch into Baghdad in 1917 to 2020, I just want to say they have three massive passions, really big passions. And Jeffrey, who's sitting here, will <laughs> know all about them. One is for my wonderful family, for Jeffrey. Um, and when I think about that, I think about Parshat Re'e this morning that I heard from Rabbi Mervis. And it talks about a blessing and a curse and the fact that we have free choice and that I will enlighten you as to the blessing and to the curse. Um, coming to Melbourne was a blessing. Meeting Jeffrey was a blessing. Having my two children was a blessing. Avi, Dan and Shira, who I would love it if they were here today. I don't really know if they are, but I'm sure they will. And having said that, I want to say that if you have a question and answer and you are from our family, please just unmute yourself and just speak out um, after I've said my, little, my few words. Okay, so what are the three passions? One is for my family. The other, as you heard, if you, when you entered um, and, and Rabbi Rabin admitted you, um, is Israel. Israel has been my passion since I went there in, nine, in eight, 18, at 18 years old. And I've wanted to live there since then. And, you know, it's taken a bit of a while, but we're getting there. Israel, religion, being about Shuva since I came to Australia. And the third one is radio. Radio has been my passion really since I came to Australia in 1984. And um, I was very um, blessed, I would say, to have been part of Radio National Religion and doing freelance interviews in our Jewish community in Sydney and Melbourne. And it's the same formula I use that I learned from Radio National Religion. So let's now look at Baghdad. Baghdad to Balaclava. And um, that's the name of a book that hasn't yet been published. <laughs> but it will be because of you, Rabbi Rabin, it's going to be published. Anyway, um, I want you all to think about, to close your eyes if you can, and imagine that you're a five-year-old boy in Baghdad, and it's 1917. And we Aussies know all about 1917 because of the, uh, the what is it, Jeffrey? The um, thing of the Light Brigade, yes, in Beersheba. So we do know about that. It's all about that time, time of the mandate, the time when the Ottoman Empire uh, was crumbling. So I want you to think you're a five-year-old boy and you're in your home in Baghdad with your mum and dad, Simcha and Yehuda Sulman. And you have six siblings. And there's a knock at the door. Oh, sorry about that. You fell down. It's not a nice, it's a very, um, how can I say it? 
um, confronting knock, I would say, and you're, you're intimidated by this knock. And can, indeed you you move a bit, can you move a bit more to the center? Oh, sorry, you're... sorry. Thank you for telling me. Thank you. Thank I do you. tend to do that. So you knock at the knock at the door and you're frightened out of your wits because you're five years old and you have your family there and the Ottoman uh, military come to you and say, your son, Gucci, will be um, showing up for, um, for military service tomorrow morning at six o'clock in the morning at the whatever barracks. And you're as frightened as anything and they leave and everybody's just shocked is not the word. And then a few moments later, another knock comes, a much more friendlier knock. And this knock is your neighbor and your neighbor is an Arab and your neighbor is a Muslim. And he says to you, no, I heard all about this Naji. Oh, probably he wouldn't be addressing it to Naji, but to your, to your father, Yehuda and Sumcha, I want to help you. Maybe I can disguise your son, Guji, and send him to, with me, disguised as an Arab, over the five-day walk to Basra in the south. We have family there. So, in fact, that's what they did. That's exactly what they did. Anyway, about a year later, or less than a year later, remember this is 1918, the end of the First World War, and you know what's happening there. The Ottomans have left many, many countries, not all the Middle East, Lebanon, all these countries, Tunisia, et cetera, et cetera. And other things are, are happening. The British coming in, and then behind them, the Arab Republic of 1928, the Nazis with Rashid Ali in 1928. And this is the history of our family. So the next time the military come, they take away the father, Yehuda Sulman. And Yehuda Sulman goes into detention. And he is probably tortured, probably no food. And he's left after a few months, you can go home. And he goes home to die. He's only 36. Sumcha Sulman is only 28, she has seven children, and Naji is only five. So Naji is my father, Guji is my uncle, and Yehuda is the grandfather I never, obviously, ever met. Sumcha, bless her, is the one who left in 1928 with her son Naji to go to Scarborough in Yorkshire. And obviously the question is, why Scarborough of all places on the northeast coast? Why would they want to go there? Well, the depression was happening as far as I know in uh, England, especially in Manchester, where some of the family were. So they said, look, go to the northeast coast because we've already got family there. Shamash. Shamash is my mother's maiden name. She was over there from Manchester. She went to Bridlington. They said, so they said, come to Bridlington. They said, and the family in Bridlington said, Nanny Lulu, who is my grandmother, mummy's mum, she said, oh, well, maybe not, because it would be a, a bit of competition for us, because we're both gift shops. Maybe move to Scarborough. Well, there was nobody in Scarborough then, but um, that's what happened. So Gucci came first. He must have been a man of about 20-something then. He was 13 years older than dad, so maybe he was about 25. So he set up his business in Scarborough. Nobody was there. There was just the family in Bridlington, only 18 miles. But I want to tell you, 18 miles in 1928 was quite different from today. So they probably didn't even see each other very much. So that was the rationale for moving to Scarborough. So here we are. Well, not me at the moment. I haven't been born yet. Um, and there comes Mummy. So Mummy Florette Shamash. I want to show you something. My mum is a heroine because this is her badge from the Women's Air Force in England, 1939 to 1945. She was a code breaker. Can you show it? She, the we couldn't see it. Sorry, Hannah. Sorry. Oh, can sorry. You? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you see it? No, but high. now we can. Yeah. We can now, sorry. So it says women's. What does it say here? Royal Air Force. It doesn't say women's, it says Royal Air Force. Sorry, you've seen my fingers. Can you see it, Daniel Ray? No, no, just lift yeah. it up. 
put it by your face sort of there you go women's order now my sister jackie who i would have loved to have on here but it's three o'clock in the morning there <laughs> um she said she gave me this for my mum when i saw her in Yerushalayim a year ago very very special so mum was a code breaker and how do i know because a year before she died when i went to visit her i interviewed her of course not for radio but just for myself and um i said mummy are you a code breaker and she said yes darling i am that was the first time she ever said she obviously couldn't during all those years and we know a lot about code breakers, don't we? But this is uh, the Air Force, not the military. A lot of people know about code breaking in the military, whether it was the American women. But women were, as you know, very, very important. I would say even solely important in the intelligence during the Second World War. So let me just have a look at my watch now. Ten minutes. Okay, that's very good. That's pretty good. Um, now, let me just tell me how they, these two met. Rabbi Rabin, have you got the family tree there we could show people? The family in, tree? I don't know. Yeah, I sent it to you in screen sharing. Could you do that? You know you have all the, the photos. Yes, hold on, hold on. Can we go to screen sharing then? Okay, fine. So while you're doing that, I'll just say. So mum in the meantime, 1939 to 1945, is in the Women's Air Force. And she's coming up the ranks there. And she's doing really well. And you've got to be pretty intelligent at maths and science to be able to do this job. Now here we've got this one, is it? This one? This one? That's fine. That's the mosaic of Yerushalayim, my maid here in Melbourne. Oh, there's one and here. this is yeah, here at Merrill's mosaic. Here is Jeffrey and I at our wedding. And then we have Mummy, Florette, Shamash, and I think Dad when he was older. And then I think we've got Shira and me in Yerushalayim. Can you go to the next one, um, Rabbi Rabin? We'll see. Okay. So, um, um, let me see. So, you, have you got the family tree? These are the only three that you can. Oh, because there's another one in your WhatsApp now. It's there. Okay. So... So this is happening. 1944, of course, towards the end of the war, things are really happening. And her command is very happy with her and says, Florette, would you like to go to Egypt? I don't know if this is true. How do I know? But I know from the facts, but I don't know if this is exactly how it happened. And she said, yes, because she'd never been out of England. So, okay, fine. But do you know what? Her mother, Nanny Lulu, was not very happy about this. I mean, after all, she was 22 years old. It was about time she got married. And also, she could be taken off by an Arab sheikh or something worse could happen to her. So, Nanny Lulu and Auntie Toba, the shatchan of the family, got together. They cooked up a little thing. Auntie Toba came from, from, from London, from Sloan Square in London. And mum, and sorry, and mum was in the house in Bridlington. And they got Naji from Scarborough, the 18 miles, to come. And they said, listen. If you don't do something, Florette is going to go to Egypt. We'll never see her again. You have to, uh, you have to marry her. So <laughs> they were cousins, first cousins. This is what all the family did anyway. They all married the first cousins. Luckily, they didn't know anyone else. There was nobody else. So this was a match made in heaven, wasn't it? Rabbi Raven. It was a match made in heaven, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> so um. So this is exactly what I was told. So dad of Naji came there at the summons of Auntie Toba. And Auntie Toba explained, and, aunt, and Grandma Lulu, who was his auntie, explained to him the situation. And they said, Florette is in there. She doesn't know anything about this, but just go in there. Do you do, be good, be a good fellow. And, um, be a knight in shining armor or whatever it was and do your deed. So <laughs> they locked them in. He couldn't get out until he proposed to her. He did propose to her. They were happy. Mum always said she really liked him. So that's the story of the two of them. And, um, but I want you to think about this. And I do hope you've opened 
into your eyes by now because I asked you to close your eyes. <laughs> you can open your eyes by um, What I want to say is, how would you imagine? Imagine this, but don't close your eyes. Imagine you're living in Baghdad and it's in the 1920s and you know, 150,000 Jews and you're living alongside Orthodox Jews, mainly, mainly Orthodox and traditional Jews, not many seculars at all. And um, there are Jew, there are Christians there, and there are Arabs, and there are Arabs there, and there are. Sorry. That's a lot of background. Sorry. What it Thank is. you. Is there a kinder near you? Or? Uh, do you want me to go? Yeah, I don't know. It's just there's lots of background noise. It's hard to. Inside. Hear, if you don't mind, yeah. Walking. Um. Oh, lovely, lovely. So I'm inside the house now. Okay. So I was just saying that. Thank you. Thanks very much. Oh my God. Just trying to. I'm just trying to put it on something. Oh. Now the volume's gone down on here. Just a minute. Can you hear me? Volume. No, you That's the trouble with all. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. No. yes. Yes, you can. Continue. I don't think so because I've got the volume. We the can volume hear you. just suddenly went down. We can hear you. That's Hannah. the trouble if you move these things. I... Just a minute. Okay. Oh. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. I don't think you can because the volume went down. See, this is what I don't like doing. Okay. Hannah, we can hear you. We can hear you. You can hear me because I can't hear you. Okay. Well, All right, that's fine. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. So that's fine. Um, where was I, Rabbi Raymond? <laughs> I don't know, you were in the garden, now you're in the kitchen. Oh, okay, I've forgotten it now. All right, okay, it's just gone. Um, all right, so I just want to say a little bit more about Baghdad. I have here something I want to read to you, but just hang on a second, because it's outside. Okay, while we're waiting, uh, thank you everybody for your patience. This is um, the nature of the... COVID-19 <laughs> Zoom presentations. Oh, that it was good in anyway. Okay. Could we have the next power, the next um, photos, the last one, number three, number two and number three? Sure. Thanks. I want to give you a little bit of an understanding. Yeah, that's it. The next one. That's it. That's it. Hold on. It's not starting. Um, you've only got three. Okay. So, no, not that one. This one? This one. The one, the black and white one, Rabbi Rabin. It's on now? Yeah. That's it. Okay. So here we are. This is their wedding. You can see on the left hand side. In the middle, that's it. In the middle there is dad and mum and this is their wedding. This is in the synagogue in Manchester, the Sephardi synagogue. And Misad Hakadushin is Rabbi Gagin. And in the middle, dad, me and Jackie. Here is Paris on the right. I believe it's Paris. One of them is Paris, 1963 or something. And here you see me on the left at the bottom. Can you make that bigger? This last one? No, you can't. Okay. There's me as a baby, six months old. And here on the right, mum at her engagement with dad. What I've just been talking about. So I want you to imagine what it was like. You left Baghdad, 150,000 Jews, living in harmony, really, really living in harmony 
with, with Christians and the Muslims. The Muslim neighbor has just saved the life of your older brother. And you move to a place where there is a spiritual desert. It is not only a spiritual desert, but it is also waspish, really. And that's where I came in. Um, so my sister, thank you. So my sisters um, were already six and five years old. And then I arrived on the 1st of January, 1953. And I want to read to you what it was like living in these worlds, because although Baghdad has physically gone, like our Holocaust survivors here, Poland, Germany, never leaves us really, even though we're in Melbourne. So what was it like living in those two worlds? Baghdad, what it means to me. Growing up on the northeast coast of England, I lived in two worlds, Yorkshire pudding, Yorkshire accents, which I didn't want to adopt. The shops, they were our life. Everything seemed to revolve around them. School holidays were spent at the shop, either mums or dads. I had to admit I preferred mums with the cuckoo clocks, chiming every quarter of an hour, and the sound of the amusements next door, and the bingo, and the inevitable 66 clickety-click. When I became that ripe old age this year, I had to chime, clickety-click, 66. This was my world. I learned customer service, writing tickets with the fountain pen, eating mum's dinner in the stockroom with all the stock perched on the table, having ice cream from Giaconelli next door or the Harbour Bar, dad's favourite haunt next door to his shop at Ace T. Eastborough. Knickerbocker glories were my delight. Dad would treat us and we would sit on the bar stools, perched high and eat the fruit, the ice cream. I'm not sure why they were so named, Sundays were busy in the shops. The day trippers would go to the beach. It was summer after all, but so often it was cold and rainy. I do remember the Glaswegian fortnight holiday, racing into the shops to buy Max. There was one customer who arrived and we were so rushed, I looked for his size, but they were only extra large. So he put it on and it was monstrous. So I gathered all the extra plastic at the back, which he couldn't see and had a happy customer. These are some of the life lessons I acquired from the forced labor of Sulman's shops. I must admit I was paid. Not sure if it was a living wage though. Back home was a refuge. Arabic ruled. Baghdad was the nostalgia. Nani Sumcha knew a few words in English, but Arabic was her medium of communication. She spoke Arabic to her son Naji and to Florette, who had along the way gained a smattering of Arabic. She was the matriarch. We all knew it and we all respected it. On her account, our relatives would travel far and wide to meet her from Israel, Canada, London and the USA. Nani Simcha, despite the fact that we spoke very little Arabic, we were all influenced so much, but often not realizing until we were in middle age. I was closest to her, to my grandma, Simcha, when she rang her bell from her bedroom, I went upstairs. That was my role. I would go to the Esplanade with her and play crazy golf. We would go to town together and visit Debenhams. I remember buying a corset with her. It is etched in my memory for life. Then to the bus via York Place, Nanny literally brandishes her stick to stop the traffic. I crouch in embarrassment. Okay, Dad had a number of obsessions. One was camels, wooden ones from Israel and Baghdad. Others were wireless in every room. Another was clocks from the old fashioned clock. So I wanna tell you now about one of my passions being radio. And I think only today, maybe the other day, cause I was doing this for Rabbi Rabin. I thought about this, you know. My passion has come for all three which is radio, English as a second language, um, religion. What was the other one? Israel. I'm not so sure about Israel with my grandmother because I think she, uh, Israel wasn't around then, but most of them have come from her. And even though I couldn't speak English to her, I was her first teacher of English as a second language at the age of eight. We used to listen to English by radio. 
from the BBC. Um, and, you know, you realize many years later that these things have come. And even though maybe you don't have the same culture, maybe you don't have the same everything, but her influence, and this is what Rabbi Rabin thought, I think, when he wrote to inspire, to captivate, and to shock. The shock is coming later. But the inspiration and the captivation is already here. It is my grandmother, Nani Simcha, who at 13 years old got married, had her first child, Gucci, at 15, who only spoke Arabic, who was not educated, like her sister, Nani Lulu, my mum's mum, not at all. But for some reason, she left such a legacy because all of us, three girls, we all married Jewish people. We all married Orthodox Jewish people. Well, two of us married Orthodox Jewish people, one Chabad and one Litvish, uh, Jeffrey. And my other sister, who didn't marry a Litvish or a Chabad, has a son in Yerushalayim, Daniel, who has five children, who is Haredi, Haredi. So you see, I want to tell you, you know, we don't know the influence of one person on us. We know what it's like with a teacher. We know how influential teachers are. And I've been teaching now for many years. I know I am influential, but, you know, to have someone there who kept Shabbos, kept Kasher, Kashrut, she put a tichel on her head when she prayed. And we did not understand this. We did not know this. Only when I became religious did I really understand. So that's just one of the things I wanted to say. And now to go back to a little bit of Arabic, and there are people there who understand a bit of Arabic. Ena fetemti Arabi shweya. Rabbi Rabin, what do you think that means? I don't know. I don't speak Arabic. Think. Anybody out there? No, you can't. You're all muted. Ena fetemti Arabi shweya means I understand a little Arabic. And if you listen to this, you'll realize how, how like Hebrew it is. Echad, Stein, Shalosh, Arba, Hamish. Where had, Tnen, Klathi, Araba, Hamsi, Siti. So I'm now going to tell a little, a little story. My grandmother used to make Tabi, Tamhasha, Kubba, Bamiya. <laughs> Beautiful food. Took a whole day to make. And she would come to the, to the big dining room. We lived in a big Victorian house with the bay windows and everything, and she would have be tired. She'd come to, the, to bring us the food. Dad had to be served first. Oh, yes. Mum, after the kids. <laughs> Poor mum. And um, this is what she would say. Rasi keujauni. Botni keujauni. Rujli keujauni. The ena kadari dat kheye. So you know what it means. My head hurts. My stomach hurts. My knee hurts. Ena kadari dat kreya sounds very much like, and I feel sick. And that's exactly <laughs> what it is. <laughs> I don't know why, but we loved her food, even though she would say that. Um, and, um, you know, we, oh, that's it. So that's that bit. Um, and um, now, We've got, how many more minutes have we got, Rabbi Rabin? Because I haven't done my, just a little bit on Melbourne, I need to do. Yes, it's not that, because, yeah, we'll, we'll open it up. To how long have we got? I don't know, 15 more minutes, 10 more minutes. Okay. With okay, questions. I'm going to put you up, because I can't hear the volume at all. Just hang on a minute. Ah, there we go. Ah, that's better. It went. Okay. Okay, so in 1984, so I had in the meantime come to London, studied psychology and sociology at Brunel University, got jobs, whatever, research, community work. Then I came just for one month to Sydney for my sister's wedding. And I stayed. Um, my, my, my parents were all going to go and my sister will have the tickets, were all gonna go. But then they became sick. So Jackie stayed behind. She said, I want you to represent the family. I got into radio 
It was amazing. Radio National, just at the end of that year. I got into teaching English as a second language. Everything I ever wanted to do was fantastic. And my sister, Sipora, was there. And then my visa started to run out. And I was one of those illegals, actually. <laughs> In those days, they weren't as, as they are today. And someone had a very bright idea. And I'm saying that very cynically. They said, you know what? Get married to someone you don't know. What? Isn't that a bit silly? No, no, you can meet him once or twice, you know. Like in the Shatran thing, it's some, you know, do it that way. In the meantime, there was another rabbi, a very great rabbi in Sydney, who said, no, go to New Zealand. I'll help you. Go to New Zealand. Okay. Anyway, the forces this way were stronger than the forces that way. I ended up marrying this fellow. I call him Imach Shmo, so you can understand. And I was married to him for three years. And when I tell you that I am very fortunate to be alive today, you will understand. He tried to kill me five times. Okay? So that maybe is the shock. But it did happen. And I'm lucky that I came to Melbourne. But in between, a wonderful thing happened, 1987, after I got my get. I went to Auschwitz. I went to Krakow. I went to um, Warsaw with the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra, having already interviewed Zubin Mehta here in Australia, in Sydney. So I kept up that connection with them. I went with them. Tel Aviv, Haifa, London, Sydney, Melbourne, Poland. 1987 to me was the most landmark year for me. And I interviewed the Prime Minister of Australia, Bob Hawke. I went to Canberra, I interviewed him about Israel. And I took that interview to Yerushalayim after I had my get, after Pesach. Actually, just before Pesach. It was real freedom. But... And it got onto the Kal Israel news. One o'clock news. Because it was about peace. So, my life looked up. And if you look at the parasha today, that I read a little bit, Re'e, it says, I put before you a blessing and a curse. And I actually feel, and it says, we have free choice. Hashem is there. He wants us to do the right thing, but it's up to us. And if we do do the right thing, he's there for us. But if we don't, so I feel as if the choice I made with forces pulling me was the wrong choice. But in the end, it's all in Hashem's thing. But the blessing was meeting Jeffrey and having my beautiful children and the next chapter is Yerushalayim. And it's not just what we all say. It is to move there as soon as possible, because that is what the majority of us all over the world are now doing. And I've wanted to be there for so many years, 50 years, actually. So I think that will be the end of my little, <laughs> the beginning. <laughs> um, and if anybody would like, up to you, Rabbi. Yeah, well, you go a little bit back. You, you, there you go. Perfect. Oh, sorry. Um, thank you, Hannah. So, yeah, look, um, interesting to hear different parts of your, your life story. And, um, um, yeah, lots, lots going on, I think, here, here, through your experience. Um, yeah, and I think, the, as far as I understood, you know, your story was one that you, you, know, you sort of uh, appreciate and you you know, you, you treasure parts of the, that um, mm -hmm. that heritage of growing up in Baghdad, well, your family coming from Baghdad and, you know, giving you that opportunity um, to understand how they live their lives and certainly all the work you've done uh, to, to date. So I guess I just asked a couple of questions. And again, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. But we do want to thank Hannah once again for um, sharing parts of her story. So Hannah, um, in terms of your Baghdadian uh, connect and your, your history, do you... Do you feel it plays a role in your life today? Yes, I do. And you know, when you come to Melbourne, and I really feel this is a, ve a very blessed place. 
And I wrote a very long article, about 2,000 words for the Australian Jewish News, about it. And Rabbi, um, oh, I've forgotten his name. I'll think of him in a minute. The Rabbi of Mizrahi, who passed away, he was there for 30 years. Jeffrey will remember. Jeffrey, what was the name of the Rabbi? Oh, you know. Anyway, never mind. Um, I said that this is like a jewel in the crown, really. Melbourne Jewelry, in a way, is like a jewel in the crown of the diaspora. It is like the Jerusalem of Australia. And Rabbi Abaranok himself said that Melbourne is like the Jerusalem of Australia. So I want to say it's wonderful being with Holocaust survivors here. I have learned so much. Do you know what? I have learned a bit of Yiddish here. I really have. I use Yiddish a lot, you know, because I see it all the time and I love it. I love languages, of course. But what I have felt, Rabbi Rabin, is this, that when I meet people, some of them religious, some of them are not religious, some of them secular, they say to me, Yiddish? You don't understand Yiddish? Are you Jewish? You see what I mean? Mm. So yes, I'm reminded of it all the time. And when I meet with Iraqi people, and there are a few people here today from Baghdad originally, I really feel that tremendous connection with them. Yeah, beautiful. So, that, so it certainly plays a role. Um, so Hannah, just one other question I wanted to ask you personally. And again, if anyone has any questions, please type them now. Um, otherwise, you can stay in touch with Hannah. Obviously, she mentioned she has her J.A. Uh, no, 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 I don't want that. I want them to unmute themselves and speak. Okay, so we will, we will offer that shortly. Okay. Um, but um, yeah, so let's do that now. Why don't we do that? I'm going to end the Facebook stream. Okay. Uh, have Thank that. You. Thank you. Everyone who's watched on Facebook. Can I just give a plug now to South Caulfield Hebrew Congregation? Any of you, wherever you are, New York, Israel. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. You, I've, I've, I've muted you by mistake. Unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah. I just want to say, any of you can, can listen in. He, is working, he and Sarah are working so hard. They are every single day, lunchtime, dinner. It's not just inspirational speakers. It's him speaking about... Kabbalah, whatever it is, is, it doesn't matter. Thank he, you. And I really commend all of you. Get, up, get onto it. SC, South Caulfield Hebrew Congregation. Thank you. So um, you are welcome to unmute yourself. Hannah would like to, if anyone wants to have a chat or say something to Hannah. Um, I know a lot of people don't like to usually do that. They get a bit shy. But if you do, uh, someone has asked, um, did your grandmother ever discuss the relationship with the neighbor? Oh, good question. Um, only that they were very good friends. She said we were, we were friends. We were very good friends. Right. We loved them. My father once said to me, uh, Rabbi Reber, he said, when it comes to, uh, it, this is no thing on my darling husband who's Ashkenaz, but I have more in common with Arabs <laughs> and Muslims the Ashkenazi Jews. Because that's what he knew, you know. Well, if you want to learn more about Ashkenazi Jews, you can join us tomorrow night with Bev Sacco at 8 o'clock. She's going to start a three-part series on understanding the Jewish uh, Ashkenazic tradition. Can I speak at all, Rabbi? Good. It's Rita here. Rita. Hi, Rita. It? Hannah? Yeah. Hannah, it's Rita. I, I worked with you back years ago at... Um, <laughs> Rita Lenny's. What? Phillips. You won't remember me. Yes, I'm Sandra please. Klein's sister. Sorry? I'm Sandra Klein's sister. Oh, of Sandy. I remember you. We worked together at Lenny's. Correct. Sorry. Correct. I knew nothing about your background other than you were English. <laughs> yeah. There we go. And I was very inspired by you then and your attitude, and I just loved you then, and you're still fantastic now. <laughs> That's all I can Not say. get together, Rita, because yeah. I'm very friends with Sandy. Yeah, sure. Sure. Thank you very much. That was lovely. Thank you. I wonder if my, any of my family is there, Rabbi Rabin. I don't know who your family is. Happy Dan, are you there? Shira? No. Diana? No. Anyone else? I'll, I'll have a look at the Hannah. participants. Hannah, this is Devorah. Devorah, Dan, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm just amazed 
how much you achieved in your life. You, you had such a full life. I'm just amazed. And uh, I wish you great success in um, moving to Israel for your Aliyah. Thank and you. And I hope one day I'll make Aliyah too. And you too. We'll go together. Yeah. Be great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank uh, you thanks. for your story. Thank you, Devon. Thank you. Let's just, I just want to see who the participants are, and then we'll... Um. Yeah, so while we're waiting, again, just plugging a few other events coming up this week. Um, Please Tuesday night starts a three-part series of Ashkenazic Jew with Bev Sacco. She's a very passionate history teacher. She's not a history teacher. She's actually an optometrist, but has incredible uh, passion for history. Wednesday night, we're going to hear from a female Jewish police officer um, about her work and what's going on currently. Oh. And then Thursday night, um, another fascinating and fun talk with um, about chesed, about kindness, from Orli Waba, from all the way from Yerushalayim, Yerak Kodesh. So I'll hand you back to Hannah. Anyone want to say anything to Hannah? Yes, I think there's Auntie Shirley here. If Auntie Shirley is here, could you... That's a different Shirley. That's, a, uh, that's another Shirley. That's I. It's another Shirley. Okay, you know, you've seen it. Okay, fine. So I don't think there's anybody in the family here, yeah. but that doesn't so, matter. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, you are welcome, as I said, to, um, to listen to Hannah's... Can I just say one plug now for the, for the J.R., which I didn't do. So I just want to let in. Someone wants to speak? No, it's okay. Okay. Um, what I want to say, Henry, I can see you. Um, J.R., 87.8 FM, most of you know it because you're from Melbourne. If there's anybody else not. So you just go onto your radio, just onto your iPad or whatever, J Air Radio, and you'll get it. You don't even need to know the website. But the website is just j-air.com.au. This week, we had just Sunday at 5 o'clock, Thursday 9 a.m., repeated Sunday 5 p.m., was on the pandemic, was on the impact of the pandemic on mental health. Um, a week before, I just, my mind goes blank. But all the podcasts are there. You just go, Hannah, H, H, not C H, H A N N A B A U M, um, radio, and you'll get all the podcasts, 51 podcasts in date order. So, anyway, that's my plug. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Hannah, for your time. Thank, Thank you. For joining, and um, we appreciate um, everybody's help. And yes, um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Hannah. That was amazing. All the best. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Take everybody. Care, Take care. Bye. Bye, Mandy. <laughs> I'm going to end the meeting now. Thanks. Bye, Reza. <laughs>